And we're live. Thank you everyone for tuning into No Capes. I am back once more with Luke Stokes, this time with faster and improved internet for better streaming quality. Um, hi, Luke. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, cut out just for a second, but I think we're good. I promise it's better and improved internet quality. Um, all right, so real quick, just give a little intro. Uh, who is Luke Stokes? I am a software developer, I guess. I started doing PHP in, I guess, 1996 was my first PHP, first like web pages in high school. And uh, I guess my claim to fame would be in 2007, built an e-commerce solution because all the other ones were terrible at the time. So we were really frustrated with everything and we needed an e-commerce solution that would meet our needs. So we built FoxyCart and through that process of providing e-commerce solutions, got to meet people in the community, in the PHP community in particular, with Cal Evans being here in Nashville. And actually, as of just recently, he used to live on the street from here. He invited me to the community in, uh, from there, I got connected to the conference scene and got to do some speaking and stuff and met some amazing people. So I guess that's how I'm connected to this group, is uh, through software I've made and the relationships I've built. <laughs> I do have to commend your uh, product placement there with that T-shirt. Very well done. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I put it on earlier today, and I was like, oh, well, it's already on. I'm not going to change it. So, yeah, there you go. Loud and proud, I guess. <laughs> when you put so much blood and sweat and tears into a company, there's no shame. There's, like, none at all. You're just like, yeah, I worked hard for this. Many, many sleepless nights. So here it is. <laughs> well, I applaud it. I think it's, it's very well done product placement. You, you should be proud of Foxy Card. Very um, well. I like to hear it. Very well-loved product. Um, but I should also I should also say I'm a father of three kids and uh, an amazing wife, and so sometimes you'll see our kids at conferences. I've got a, a six year old, a four year old, and a soon to be two year old. So I've, I've there are some people in the PHP community that I roll with that also will bring their kids to conferences, which is super awesome. So we have a lot of fun doing that. So that's something that I actually haven't done. Um, I've gone to several conferences. <laughs> Speaking of children, um, my daughter just stuck an ice cube to her tongue. So. <clears throat> totally understand. Yeah, that's totally, totally great. Um, so <laughs> I go to lots of conferences. I've never taken my children. Um, I've thought about it before. Um, so when you go to conferences with your kids, do you take your wife with you or? Yes. What we generally have done is we turned it into like a, a, an awesome road trip. We always want an excuse because I can work from anywhere and I can, you know, go off my phone and tether like that. And so we've done Sunshine PHP a couple times and we're in Nashville. So we do drive down two days to Sunshine. We've done two days to Lone Star, done that a couple times as well, Lone Star PHP. And so basically she hangs out in the pool or we'll go and like visit friends or go do some cool stuff in the city. But usually it's the hotel pool and she has a great time. The kids have a great time. They, uh, they're starting to get to know some of the other people in the community. Uh, I thought it was great at, at uh, Lone Star like it was the highlight of Cal's conference event is that my daughter Aria came running up to Cal and you know big hugs and the whole time you know just you know <laughs> giving him a big hug and stuff when I was finishing up the keynote it was just hilarious and funny to see that you know my friends are becoming their friends too and it's neat to to have them talk about you know who they play with at the pool and stuff that's awesome I think that's that's a really good thing for the PHP community to be you know family friendly and inclusive and um, <clears throat> There's some people, myself included, I can't go to conferences anymore, um, you know, when I have my kids, hmm. unless I bring them. So that might be a viable option for me. We, You know, I've talked to a couple of different conference organizers. I've gotten to know a few of them just because we've sponsored uh, quite a few conferences and stuff. And there, there have been some talks, you know, uh, Bo and Beth and some other people that generally, you know, often bring their kids. There have been some talks of having, like, family tracks and stuff, which would be kind of kind of cool. So we'll see. If there's enough uh, interest on it, I'm sure it'll happen. Community wins. And they make stuff happen. I think it'd be really cool to, um, for like the older kids, like my daughter's nine. Mm -hmm. uh, she's my oldest, to have like a, a little mini kids hackathon thing. Oh, that'd be cool. Give the kids some laptops, let them, you know, have some fun. Away. I yeah. would totally organize that. I would put that together for a conference. Some oh, conference that wants that, that please cool. tell me. I will, I will make it happen. That would be so cool. I, I know here in town, my friend, it's a, not PHP, but they put on a Pi Tennessee, a Python conference, and they got enough sponsors that they had, I think, 25 Raspberry Pis that they gave to a bunch of students, and they had an entire room dedicated to teaching them how to code Python with their own Raspberry Pis in the room during the conference, and that was just awesome. It was super cool. 
yes yes we should do this this should happen that would be cool right. that's, I'm that not, should be PHP. I actually uh, a couple years ago i got my son he's six now he was five at the time he got him his own raspberry pi and we started teaching him how to code in um in uh it's the mit language um Oh, I'm drawing a bank, but it's basically like drag and droppable in Scratch. Oh. So we build video games. We've built like all the classics, like Pong and Breakout and Asteroids, and like we have all these different ones. So I should plug his website. It's gamesbydevin.wordpress.com. And so we, we did this early on, like because he wanted to play all these different games, and I said, "Well, hey, we can build them." So we started building them, and then I'm a big Bitcoin enthusiast as well. So I put up a Bitcoin address, and I started saying, "Hey, you know, you can actually sell these and and af ask for donations." So my son at five, he made over 50 bucks in donations in Bitcoin. And so he bought his own like pocket knife and stuff with his own Bitcoin money. And it was, that was really cool. But we you have spelled Devon. Uh, D E V O N. So it's games by Devon dot wordpress.com. I haven't updated in a while. We've built one or two more games that I haven't bothered to build out the, the page for, but I've got some videos there of like, you know, him hunting and pecking as I explain the, what the variable name should be called and stuff like that. So we, we do it together, sitting together. I, I do most of the coding at this point, but we built one recently where he actually did all of it. It was, it was a two, it was like a bullfighter game and these bulls would come in like, butt their head at each other and it was hilarious. And he, he, I made him do everything. I would just point at what he should do next. And it was, it was really neat. We have a lot of fun with that. That is awesome. That is very, very cool. Um, my Cal Evans actually, um, sent my daughter a Kano computer. Um, oh, sweet. Little, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember when a, that Kickstarter came out, it looked so cool. I was like, that is the coolest thing. Yeah, I guess he backed the Kickstarter and then didn't have someone to use it, so he offered it to me and I gave it to Lydia. Um, there's like Minecraft on it and some little like Python stuff, um, and so we were learning Python together. And um, yesterday, actually, I brought her to work with me because she's in town um, for a week before she heads off for the summer. And uh, she sat next to me and watched me write PHP spec tests. Nice. And so she's like, why are you testing? And what does this dollar sign mean? And why does all this stuff? And so I got to walk her through. And then um, today she comes up to me, and I was still writing tests. And she was, why are you still testing? <laughs> and Chris Hart just says, because. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to show her a grumpy programmer meme and be like, this is why. This, this very scary man told me to do it. Nice. Uh, but yeah, no, I think it's amazing to show, you know, show what we do to our kids. And it's obviously something that we're very passionate about. So sharing that with them and once they reach the age where they're old enough to kind of start to get it, it's really, really fun. Yeah, I, I hope they do. I mean, it's like anything. I think good parenting doesn't involve like pushing stuff on them, but just exposing them to stuff. And I'm, it's my kind of hope and dream that they'll get into it. And even my daughter, she's four now. Uh, we, I worked with her to do a little ballerina game, which was, you know, it has these sprites in Scratch that you can just import. And they had multiple positions. You know, the ballerina kind of does all these different positions. So we we set it so that it'll randomly dance around the screen, and she could control it and speed it up and slow it down and stuff. And she was just all excited about it. So secretly, I, I hope that they get into programming because I, I think programming is the future. I think you know, with the rise of artificial intelligence and super intelligence and all this other stuff that I like to spend my time researching, it's like it's going to be really important to know how to code even more so than it is now. I think in the future and even having the ability to code morality and things like that. Like these are things that I think are going to be really important and having philosophically sound people who can code and all that. I just, I, I think it's going to be super important. We need more, more humans doing that kind of stuff. So if my kids could be part of that, that'd be sweet. <laughs> Definitely. So that, that brings up an interesting thing. That's not necessarily related, but there's a lot of people who push um, coding. as like the new literacy, you know? So you got like, you know, reading math yeah. and whatever, I can't remember what the other one. There's those three tenants that we're supposed to learn, and then they're saying that like coding is right up there with that. Um, how do you feel about that? Like everyone should learn to code. I, you know, there's that video that goes around. I think Obama's in it, and some other people. It's like the, you know, everyone needs to learn code, uh, and I think it's like two or three minute videos. It's a really good video, and I, I've I've definitely shared that with some people and, and pushed it a bit. I, that's a good question. I I could definitely make an argument for that, just because of the nature, our, the nature of our reality, the human existence that we're going to be experiencing, especially my kids are going to be experiencing, is digital. I mean, in so many ways. I, I run a remote team with people all over the world, and we interact digitally, just like you and I are doing now. And I think the ability to speak that language and be able to influence that digital world, that reality. I mean, you look at Oculus Rift and these other virtual reality systems. Like, it's only going to become more and more real. The virtual aspect 
of our kind of human condition and existence that I think it's going to be a really important skill. And I think the people that can understand that are going to be able to shape the reality in a lot of ways. Whether or not, you know, it's a, it's a have to as far as like, okay, you need to know math and science and, and English or speaking, you know, whatever your native language is. I don't know if we're quite there, but we might, we might be there soon. And, and also at the same time, the, the flip side of that is, you, you know, with languages like Wolfram language or any kind of like the third level languages, maybe programming as you and I understand it will become irrelevant. Maybe it's more just thinking, you know, maybe it's, can I think in abstract terms in a way to build something? You know, I think that the, the kids who grow up playing Minecraft in many ways, that's going to be the way that they think about stuff. Can I move and manipulate this virtual environment? And so maybe the, the idea of like hunting and pecking and, you know, semicolon, you know, it's just going to be laughable. Maybe it'd be like the way we think about programming to registers in assembly where you'd be like, what? Nobody does that anymore. Like you actually wrote code. No, it's all drag and drop now, you know, or, or no, you speak to it or, you know, you plug it into your brain. You imagine it. If it doesn't work, you re, you know, recompile to, you know, 12 milliseconds later. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that it's, it's important. Definitely. I don't know if I can make the argument that it's important as learning math, but it's, yeah, I'd say it's right up there. At least I, I, it is for my kids. I can answer that much. <laughs> so, it's reading, writing, and arithmetic. I just thought of it, and yes, I wanted to yes. you know, fix that idiocy on my part. But so I, I've kind of gone back and forth on this whole coding as a new literacy. I think that problem solving is definitely a skill everyone should have, and logic is definitely a skill everyone should have. But I think mm -hmm. saying that coding is something everyone should know how to do is equivalent to saying, like, everyone should know how to be a lawyer mm -hmm. or a doctor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you would never say that. Like, those are specialists in their field who spent a lot of time doing what they do, and... I think that software engineers are not, maybe not quite on the level of a doctor. I'm not a brain surgeon, but <laughs> you know, coding is, is a specialized field. I don't think it's necessarily something everyone needs to do. And I think it's something that's hard uh, bordering on impossible to do if you don't actually really love it. Mm. Um, the same with like law. You couldn't pay me enough to be a lawyer because that's just not my cup of tea. Um, yeah. I, I think also too, there are levels to it. You know, it's like, Having a blog where you could maybe go in there and feel comfortable adding, you know, some bold tags or, you know, building a link to your, you know, your buddy's blog, you know, or that kind of thing. I think there's going to be levels of what we call programming. And I think that, like, even just using technology effectively, whether it's social media or whatever, as a communication medium, I think being technologically aware is going to be really important. Oh, yeah. And I think I mean, then there's going to be this, like, continuum between I can use the tools and I can maybe build some stuff to like, I'm actually what you and I would call a coder, you know? And I, I think that it's gonna be interesting. I think those lines might blur a little bit as, as things get more advanced. Yeah, I think for, I don't know now, cause I don't have any kids that are in like middle school or high school, but you know, they taught us like word processing hmm. um, and you know, like you had to know Word and you had to know Excel and those were the things that you had to know. And I could definitely see like, basic HTML being added to that had to know list where yeah. you need to know what a bold tag is and a, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, once you get up into the higher level, I definitely think that it's not necessary Yeah. Um, in the same way that reading, writing, and arithmetic are necessary. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Like I said, I, I can could, I could make an argument, but I always am looking way into the future. And again, I, programming as we know it would probably look different than anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really waiting for those. Like, I, I really want, like, the matrix where I can just plug in, like, USB cards and be like, oh, now I know Kung Fu. Yes. Come at me, bro. Have you seen The Ghost in the Shell? Have you ever watched that anime? I have not, no. I'm not a huge anime fan, and I've had so many people recommend it. I finally watched Ghost in the Shell, and it's amazing. They have something called the Cyber Brain, which is, it's funny, because I'll watch Ghost in the Shell, and then I'll see, like, some news story, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's the same thing. That's crazy. <laughs> but it's, no, a, it's I, a pretty well-known uh, uh, anime, pretty famous one. The, go the Ghost in the Shell, the standalone complex is, I think, one of the, the is the one I watched. I want to check it out. I have a lot of friends that are really into anime, and I've heard that title a couple times, but I've never seen it. Hmm. It's got the classic Japanese anime, you know, girl with two little clothes on stuff. But what's interesting, as the story goes on, you end up realizing it might actually be a man, and that's just the cyber body that it has. And so, it, yeah, it's a little bit interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to give it a watch. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Back to questions. Yes. <laughs> um, so you got into the PHP community via Cal, um, and uh, I know that you're a pretty well-known speaker, and you mentioned having given a keynote before. Um, so how did you actually get into speaking? 
It, uh, it started with, I, well, I met Cal at the Nashville PHP group, and I was just talking about some of the stuff I've been doing. At the time, I'd just been getting into hypermedia APIs. We had to rebuild the FoxyCard API, and the more I learned about it, I was like, okay, we have what's called the POX, the plain old XML, and it's not very great. And I use it, and I have to look up the documentation all the time to figure out what the different methods are, and you know, it's just a remote procedure call system over XML, not very great. And so I started learning about, you know, what's the very best way to make an API? And I started watching tons of webinars and reading all kinds of stuff. The API Craft Google Group, which is just amazing, um, started reading all about that. And I started learning about REST APIs, hypermedia APIs. And so I started talking to Cal about it. And he said, hey, you, you've got you've to come to my conference. I run this conference called PHP Tech. You know, at the time, he was involved in that. And he said, and, uh, you got to come speak. And I was like, well, I've never spoken to a conference before. And he's like, well, you'll be fine. But come speak at the Nashville PHP group first. So I did that. And I was like, OK, that's, that's not too bad. And I put together a little, a little slideshow just kind of talking about our story of going from a plain old XML API to this hypermedia API. And so then he convinced me to go. And then later, I found out like PHP Tech is kind of a big deal. Um, it's a big PHP conference. And I was crazy nervous. But it, it, went, it went well. It went really well. And I remember. Uh, meeting Larry Garfield there and afterwards like demonstrating the HAL browser and HAL is a hypermedia API, it's a hypermedia format, JSON uh, with, with links format. And uh, I, as part of the presentation, we were kind of demonstrating how it works and he's like, okay, that is cool. I've never seen like practical hypermedia done in such a way where I can get it and rest in a way that like, wow, that's a browser that you can just kind of work with. And later through that relationship, uh, they started uh, they brought me into some of the Drupal conversations, and, and they ended up using HAL for Drupal, which is really cool. I'm super excited about it. So their API stuff is using HAL. And then I met Adam Culp there, who said, hey, you got to come speak at my conference, too. It's in Florida. Florida's nice in the winter. And I was like, OK, we can make this happen. And so I spoke there for the second time. And then after that, I think we kind of started sponsoring conferences through FoxyCart as we started to get involved in the community. And I got asked to speak at a couple other places, or, or I got you know accepted to speak at uh, Lone Star. and. I I think I, I get confused whether or not we sponsored or I spoke at Midwest, BHB, and some of the other ones. Um, but I do know, like, just this year, I kind of was like, okay, I've, I've spoken a few different places. I'm going to kind of put it on hold a little bit and not submit so much because it just takes a lot of time and effort. And then I got asked to do the PHP World keynote. And then Lone Star asked me to do the same keynote, which is just kind of telling the story about building a business is really hard. Like, it's really hard. We've been doing this for eight years now, actually July is eight years, or no, June this month is eight years, and it's really difficult, and a lot of people don't, like, tell that whole story, they just see stuff online, and they're like, oh, yeah, and, you know, nine months, you know, you have millions of dollars people want to throw at you, and it's, it's, that's usually not how it goes, it's just, like, I worked a full-time job while building FoxyCard on the side, so I'd be up to one, two in the morning, you know, working on this thing, and then I'd spend a 10-hour day on Saturday working, and then I'd, you know, take Sunday off and hang out with my family, and I didn't do that for three weeks or three months or nine months or a year. I did that for four years, and that was a long time. And most people don't hear that story when they're like, I've got an idea to build my own company. Oftentimes, I just kind of smile and say, no, not really. Like, you just, <laughs> I know you all have to know it's like a few months into it, you're going to probably be burned out, and it's really tough. And, and just having an amazing business partner, Brett Florio, was awesome. I mean, we, we would challenge each other, encourage each other. My wife is amazing. She would talk me off the ledge when I'd be like, I just spent, you know, an eight hour day at work and now it's two in the morning. I've been working for, you know, five hours today and all I got was one sign up for $15 a month. What am I doing with my life? Yeah, I'm a failure. And she'd be like, no, no, think long term. And here we are now. You know, I've been full time with it uh, almost, let's see, September of 20, yeah, almost four years now full time. And the first year that I went full time, we got to go and spend 10 weeks in Costa Rica. And that was, we, at that time we had two kids and it was just an amazing experience. And I was sitting there thinking like, I'm, I'm living the life, like all that hard work, everything was worth it. I'm sitting here up in the mountains, there's monkeys climbing through the trees and I've got my laptop and I'm coding and I just surfed this morning and oh my gosh, pinch me, is this real? And so it's, it's a hard, hard thing and it's really difficult, but it's also worth it. Now, I don't have this amazing exit story yet where we, you know, make a whole bunch of money. It's just a lifestyle business, but we got eight or nine people, you know, it's a team of pretty awesome people doing cool stuff. So I'm pretty excited about it. That was a long answer. So <laughs> no, it was, but it was, it was a really good answer. Um, and it, it sparked a lot of questions for me. Um, real quick, before we get too distance from the kid thing though, um, mm. we had, we did have a question come in, um, said if your kid was 18 years old and wanted to go to a conference in a foreign country, how would you deal with that? 
Oh, wow. That's a good question. I, I think it, everything would depend on the relationship I built up with them at that point. How much trust have they already gained with me? I mean, 18, 18 is a young age, but technically an adult. So it's like, well, I mean, 18 or 21, however you look at it. But I think 18 is technically adult. So ultimately, they're going to do whatever they want to do at that age, I'd imagine. Right. But I would hope at that point, if they're even coming to me for advice, that's a good sign. So I'd imagine that we built some trust there. And I would... Uh, you know, I'd want to make sure that they had some close friends there, people that I knew already, people that I trusted. That would be ideal in my mind. Just and and I guess I'd wish that on anybody who's just going to a new country and doesn't have a whole lot of life experience at that point with that kind of stuff. But I would encourage them. I think if if I if I knew that they were going to be with people that were safe and that if I knew that uh, they'd kind of proven themselves to be trustworthy up to that point, so I think it'd be an amazing life experience. I'd want to go with them probably. <laughs> Just for just not to like chaperone, just because I think it would be an amazing trip to go on together. Absolutely. I have you been to Europe? I have not. That is a thing that's been on our list. Karina and I, my wife and I, have talked about it quite a bit. We've talked about it. as the kids get just a little bit older, we want to make it happen. I've got a, a friend that moved to Germany. Hey, she's from Germany. We lived here as we got to know him, and then he moved back and. We keep just trying to figure out some way that we can get to Germany. <laughs> and every time I, may, I every time I talk to Michelangelo and a bunch of other people that I see at the PHP conferences, they're always like, "Come on, PHP Benelux and all this. You got to make it out." You know, I've yet to submit to something, but I, I probably will at some point submit to some conference. See if I get lucky. I think yeah, I've been to Europe twice. It's absolutely amazing. Nice. Um, as for the letting my eighteen-year-old go, it's going to depend uh, if it's a tech conference. For one, I'm assuming that that's what that was meant by the question. Um, and how well I know the community, how well I know the people they're going with. The main concern for me would be that the legal drinking age in Europe is 18. <laughs> That's a good concern. <laughs> you know, bail money is a lot harder to get across, you know, over the ocean <laughs> if they were to get in trouble. Um, yeah. Important point, yes. Yeah, and I would probably be a lot more hesitant about letting my daughter go than my, my sons, which is horrible and awful, but I, I know how places are. Yeah. And that would scare me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd probably try to go with them. <laughs> um, okay, so back to, to some of the things that you said that I thought were pretty interesting and I wanted to kind of dive a little deeper into. Um, you, so you worked a full-time job for the majority of the time that you were building FoxyGuard. Yeah, uh, for the right? first first half of it at this point. Yeah, full time. So it was it kind of started off as a hobby. And I'll tell people often like when they're like, oh, I'm going to build this other thing. I'm like, well, if, if your revenue minus your expenses, if that number is not a positive number, it's still a hobby. Like, <laughs> if you're not making money, and you can't like, support your family, you know, just okay, call it a hobby. It used to bug my business partner to no end though. He'd be like, it's not a hobby. We got real customers. I was like, yeah, but we're still working full time jobs. So <laughs> But yeah, it was it was a side thing. We didn't we never took funding, so we own all of it, which is nice. A lot of tech companies can't say that, so I'm I'm really proud of that. I'm proud that you know that we can, if there ever is a moment where there's some value to take out of it, then we can do that. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of work too. Yeah. So when you decided um, after after all that time of working a full time job and doing it, um, how? absolutely scared out of your mind were you when you went full time <laughs> with Foxy Ah, oh, that's a good one. I, you know, it's funny. The traditional entrepreneur story you you hear is like, I pulled the ripcord. I've got 20 bucks in the bank and woohoo, I'm an entrepreneur, you know? And, and I think I actually probably stayed a year longer than I needed to financially. Uh, I loved the job I was at. Uh, I, I was leading a small team of guys, developers. Um, I was actually kind of doing three different jobs at the time there in that building. I was leading a team as a team lead. I was a technical lead for that team. And then I was also doing their e-commerce development. Um, unfortunately not using Foxcart, which would have been awesome. But it, it, so I was worried that, you know, how are they going to replace me? I was worried about all this other stuff. But from a financial standpoint, we had hired, I think two or three people at that point. My business partner had already gone full time and he was kind of just pressuring me saying, Hey man, let's do this. Let's, let's pull the cord. Let's make it happen. And, um, and so when we finally did make the shift, it was scary, but we had some savings. We had gotten out of our debt. Like I still have debt on my home, but we had paid off my school loans. We had paid off uh, a second mortgage. And so like there were some, there was a, there was a safety net there. And that's something that I really preach often. I tell people all the time, like, Hey, like don't do the crazy thing. Uh, if you're not prepared, you know, there's, you've got to get your finances in order. You've got like, cause especially if you're married with kids, like, 
you know, in my case, my wife, she's got to have, she's got that security gland, you know, she's got to know that things are going to be taken care of. And if I haven't, you know, if we're not prepared in that way, then that would just be, that would be a big problem. It would, it would mess up the relationship and mess up and stress everybody out. And so it was crazy and stressful to a point, but at the same time, also the nature of the business being a monthly recurring revenue kind of setup was a lot of security there. It was like, we'd have to mess up really bad to lose all these customers, you know, and we've been, we've been providing great service for them for years. And so they're going to pay us every month. And so a lot of businesses like if you made a hundred dollars this month, you have to go figure out how to do that again next month just to break even. Whereas next month, if we gain any new stores, well, that's bonus. That's actually extra and that increases our revenue. So monthly recurring revenue, very awesome when it comes to security and safety. <laughs> all right. So so the subscription-based service is what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. It's very, very nice if you can. Yeah, I've toyed with the idea of like being an entrepreneur before, and I've got kids. Like they need to eat, and yeah. I've always been entirely too scared. I, I've heard great stories about people who've done it, and they're very successful, and they're very happy. But I am very attached to my bi-monthly paycheck that just shows up. Yes, it is. It is a nice thing. I, I can remember um, the big concern was like when my my first goal with Foxcar was that my wife could stop working and raise our family. So once my son was born, it was like, okay, this is this is the goal. And I remember that was that was probably the scariest part when she stopped working. We stopped having that dual income. Um, and and I'm, I'll never forget when we did our taxes at the end of the year and we looked at it and we're like, okay, here's where, you know, halfway through the year you stopped working and that income just died. But then here's the Foxy card income, just kind of, you know, a little train that could slowly and steadily working its way up, you know, every month, you know, a little more, a little more, a little more. And then it, when we averaged it out and we did our taxes, we're like, we're right where we were last year. Like we didn't even lose, like if this is our lean, like entrepreneur, you know, you know, uh, moment like, wow. And again, that for me, that was, that was it. I was like, my wife can stay home. I'll continue working these crazy hours late at night and my, and my full-time job, if that's going to enable her to stay home. Cause nowadays it's hard enough just to, you know, I can't imagine, you know, being a single parent. It's just, Oh, it's so difficult. I can't imagine. And most people I know, they both their husband and their wife have to work and just to, just to make it, you know, and it's just oh, insane. So that, that was probably the scarier part. And then once we got through that, uh, by the time my second was born, uh, I was kind of like, wow, I'm, I'm missing so much at home. I want to be home. So let's see if we can make this work. But yeah, it's definitely a little scary. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's also, I think you did it in a really, a really, really smart way. The whole like pull the rip cord, take the plunge is just, it seems so just terrifying. To me. I, well, it's, I think it's terrifying for a reason. I mean, statistically, most small businesses don't survive. Let, I mean, let alone the first year, but five years in, most are gone. And here we are going on eight years. Like, as much as I, I mean, just today, I was in a three hour conference call and it was just, it was death. I'm just so frustrated, like, going, man, why aren't we better at everything? You know, <laughs> like, I, I, you know, it's just, you get frustrated even now because you have such, you know, ambitions to, to make it great. And, and, you know, we're, we're up against companies that have a hundred million plus dollars in funding and you know IPOs and this that and the other and it's, it's it's really tough. We're a little guy trying to make a difference, but at the same time, I look back and say, hey, we've done some cool stuff. Like in many ways, we've kind of plowed a new category within e-commerce. It's like e-commerce that you add to your website. It's not like your entire website, and that's that's a big deal. Like most people, like even even X.com, even PayPal tried to do that and get developers excited about it, and it didn't work out. And yet we just kept doing it. And now you've got you know, Stripe and Molten and even, you know, even Shopify now has their own kind of plug-in thing you can add to your existing website. And, you know, there's a lot of really great solutions out now that are kind of proving that that model is a good model. So, yeah. yeah I think you've done well with it. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about and that I think is really commendable is, you know, you started in the PH community, you know, you were speaking, you had this side project, um, you were working on on the side that you later turned into a business and then you started sponsoring con conferences um, and kind of giving back to the community um, as Foxy Cards. Um, so what kind of influenced your decision to do that and you know what what gains have you have you seen from it like that's actually part of what that three-hour conversation was today. <laughs> there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a, an opportunity that's actually not tech-related. Um, it's more marketing-related. A conference that we're debating about whether or not, and it's 
very expensive. And and it, it just it, it got us thinking about those kind of things historically. Like we've sponsored, we sponsored a lot of conferences. And we always try to be like, if we're gonna sponsor a conference, we wanna be there. So we've sponsored here in Nashville, uh, Coder Fair, that's, that's another one I forgot to mention I got to speak at. But uh, Coder Fair, Midwest PHP, uh, Sunshine PHP, Lone Star PHP, uh, we mentioned Grumpy Programmer. We sponsored his conference one year, and Brett went. Like, we always want to go if we're going to sponsor. Because it's not just like, hey, here's our money, good luck. It's like, no, 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 we're here to be part of the community and build a relationship. And I think the reason for that was, um, you know, I think going to the conferences, speaking those first couple times, I realized that, hey, this only happens because of the sponsors. And then, two, as I got to meet those people that run those conferences, right away, obviously, they're like, oh, you've got a company, you've got money, are you interested in sponsoring? So we got asked, which is great. It, like, definitely ask. There's no no problem in asking. And and we just started thinking about going, hey, this could be a, a good opportunity to let developers know that we exist. Like, we're a tool set for developers, built by developers, for people that want to do e-commerce. We were so frustrated with all the PCI compliance and all the, like, you know, you, you leave a project and three years later, the site gets hacked and they're freaking out. And you're like, whoa, you should be using a hosted solution. Like, you shouldn't be dealing with that. Shouldn't have card numbers on the server, that kind of stuff. And so it was more of a, like, hey, can, can, we, can we, you know, make this a benefit for us and them? And I think we've never been super great at how business savvy we are when we do that. Like, the biggest conference we've ever sponsored was ZenCon uh, last year. And we got amazing uh, foot traffic, in, in, and we got to do some awesome demos. But it's been, I think our challenge has been following up with it, like doing the whole marketing sales thing to be like, all right, now that we got your email, we're going to get you to buy, you know? And we actually just ran some numbers today, and it was kind of discouraging to think like, yeah, we didn't really convert a lot of those. It's a great conference. I'm really glad we were able to support it, and, and it, was, it was great to be a part of it. And again, great relationship building for a lot of people. Um, but it's a challenging thing. We're kind of struggling with that. Like, I've, I've, I even just today, I had to tell a friend that we weren't going to sponsor one of their conferences. You know, I got asked today, and we decided this year to kind of pull back on a lot of our conference sponsorships, mainly because we're, we don't do a great job of that follow-through. And, and also, like I mentioned, some of these other opportunities where we're going to try it potentially in a different angle um, with some integration marketing, some different integrations we're doing and being involved in those communities as well. But, yeah, it's... It's a, it's a tricky one for us. It's one that it's like, I love to support the community, and I love that we're able to enable those conferences to happen. And also, like, some of my friends are like, man, I just want you there, so, like, we'll give you even a, you know, they, they, they do a great thing to get us to be there. But but it is also kind of a business decision. We take time off work, you know, there's flights, hotels, all that kind of stuff. And so it's always tough to be like, was that worth it? I don't know. You know, from a financial business standpoint, it's difficult to measure sometimes. But community-wise, we're always like, man, that was awesome. What a great time. Do you have people on staff that are handling like conversions and marketing and growth and that sort of stuff? To an extent. Uh, Brett, my business partner, handles a lot of that along with everything else, <laughs> a lot of everything else. Uh, we recently, in the last four months, we hired someone who's got more of that experience doing some business development for us. And so we're, we're branching out in that area, but we haven't really traditionally done a lot of sales and marketing. Uh, we've, it's really word of mouth advertising has been the reason we've grown, which is the best form of advertising. You know, somebody uses it, it's a great product, they tell their friends, I mean, you can't beat that at all. Uh, part of it too is I wonder how much the marketplace is just changing. It's kind of like, does traditional marketing and sales and conference, you know, booths, does that even really work, you know, compared to, you know, oh, hey, I, my buddy's using this and says it's great, so I'm going to check it out, you know, because everything's online, you, you, there's no secret, there's no gatekeepers anymore, it's all there. Right, yeah, I can, I can see that. Um... I think it's a struggle that just about every company anywhere is, is having the, the shift that our ever connectedness is the always on, always internet thing. It's it's difficult mm. to compete um, in that kind of marketplace. And word of mouth is never going to be replaced as the best form of advertising. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> it's just uh, it's it's trustworthy, that's the thing. It's what matters. What do you think um, is the hardest part about running a company? The hardest part? Um, probably just managing expectations. You know, between, like, in my case, I've got a business partner, so just managing expectations between each other and with the team and then with your customers, too. Like, we don't, we always want to under-promise and over-deliver, so I get really frustrated if we, like, commit to something and then don't deliver as excellently as I'd like to, or, um, or if there's like a bug and I'm like, man, that just, that shouldn't be there. Like we expect more than that out of ourselves. So that's just that expectation, following through on those expectations 
and um, managing kind of your own dreams for what it can be. You know, I think we, we've got such great visions and we, again, we compare ourselves to companies that have, you know, hundreds of employees and millions and millions of dollars. And it's, it's can be difficult sometimes to be like, well, how come we're not doing that? And how come we're not, you know, making that success or, or being at that point. So our own expectations of ourselves and where we think we can be with the resources we have, uh, making good decisions, you know, with your time, you know, probably one of the most difficult things is we all get 24 hours, but we don't, just because you work today doesn't mean you worked on the best thing or that was the most effective. I think there's been multiple projects we've started that we haven't really launched. So we've sunk a lot of money in R&D and then kind of that last 20% takes 80% of the time. And so there's a bunch of things that we're right on the crust with them like, man, this is going to be so great when we get this out there, but it's just not launched yet, you know, in, a, in an effective way for customers to use. So expectations and delivering probably shipping as, as they <laughs> As say Seth Godin and all them say, you got to ship it. Yeah, ship yeah it. just just ship it. Yeah, <laughs> they say just ship it. Um, so when you're when you're launching new features, do you guys do like A/B testing or beta testing? We well, I think yes and no. We've we've done bits and pieces of that where we'll turn on little features for certain people. What we try to do, and this is kind of unique, I think, in a lot of a lot of software as a service and hosted software companies don't do it this way, and maybe it's the wrong way to do it, but this is how we've always done it. We have right now probably 10 different versions of Foxcart live in production with another five or 10 or so that we've sunsetted. So basically the idea is when you sign up today, in, in theory, you're gonna get what you signed up for, you know, warts and all. So if it's got bugs, you know, or it's you're missing features, you're getting what you signed up for. And that has been great because it's like, I think a lot of developers, they get so frustrated with a third party service that they use. And then later, you know, three in the morning, it just breaks. And they're like, we didn't change anything. How did it break? And they get really frustrated with that. So we, as a hosted solution, we always try to version what we put out there. And so if there's a major change or something broken, like you know, if we change something like a backward compatibility issue, it's not gonna affect you until you manually go and upgrade. And so I'm gonna walk through the upgrade docs and I'm gonna upgrade the, the stuff. But then within that, we also don't wanna release a new version just for the heck of it. So sometimes we'll turn on features, kind of like Facebook does, like dark turn on features for certain stores. So we've done that. We actually have in our system where it's like, hey, these are the list of stores that support a certain feature. So we turn on that feature just for them, for enterprise clients or advanced clients. You know, they need a feature. We're like, yeah, that's a great feature, but it might cause some confusion for people that didn't plan on that feature. So we'll just turn it on for them and we'll roll it into a new version. But then as far as beta testing for the Hypermedia API that I was talking about, we actually rolled that out to a product called OrderDesk, which is an order management system that uh, uh, SparkWeb and David over there built. He built a great uh, WordPress plugin called FoxyShop and he also built OrderDesk. So we said, okay, Let's just slowly start using it for that. And that was a really good kind of beta test example where we hadn't really, you know, tried the, the new API in production until he got to tinker with it. And that was great for the last year or so. He's given us all kinds of little little tweaks and, and stuff on that Hypermedia API that we've been able to improve, which has been great. Because that way it's like, you know, we don't have to do a breaking change with, you know, a whole bunch of different platforms using it at this point. It's just him. So we, we kind of synchronize our clocks and say, all right, pushing the code now and he changes his code and everybody's happy. So we've kind of done a mix of both beta and versioning. So with your hypermedia API that you were talking about earlier, how long has that been in production? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, publicly in production for anyone to be able to just sign up and create an account, uh, that's more recent. That's within the last few months, but the Production database access for specific OAuth clients. We've kind of white labeled a certain number of OAuth clients, OrderDesk being one of them. It's been a good year and a half. The project itself has been going on for years. It was kind of my side project. I started going to RestFest, uh, which is a really great, really great API conference for REST APIs. Learned a ton there. I've been there the last three years. I'm um, hoping to go again this year. Really fantastic. And just each conference kind of learned a little bit more, improved it a little bit more. And so, and actually just, oh man, probably two weeks ago, finally finished all the documentation. So that was like a really big, we had it out there without the full, like every single resource fully documented. So if you go to api.foxycart.com in your browser, uh, it'll redirect to the docs. And I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy about that. We're not using any of the standard kind of API documentation tool sets that are out there, Swagger or IO docs or all these other ones. My biggest complaint has always been and I've talked to the apiary guys and, and a bunch of other people. And a lot of people are like, man, I totally agree with you. I've talked to uh, MWAP as well. Um, 
and he, he at Zen, and he agrees as well, that the systems, the problem with REST APIs today and hypermedia APIs in particular that actually use hypermedia as the engine of application state, they rely on URLs. And the documentation is built in such a way that here's a URL, run a get, run a post, run a patch. And that's just fundamentally wrong. That's not how the internet is built. That's not how hypermedia works. You know, when I go to ESPN.com, I don't have to like download a new browser if the you know content of the web page changes. The browser just interprets the message and shows me the links. And then as the user, I can go and do other things. So if they move the login button, it doesn't break my process. It's just, oh, okay, there it is, and I use it. Well, it's the same thing with hypermedia APIs and hypermedia API clients. They should be very decoupled. And you should have this kind of server determining what the next actions are. This is one of the constraints of REST. So those documentation systems, they don't do that. And so I've tried to push the idea of we're going to document the link relationships. And that's really how hypermedia APIs should effectively work is that from the homepage, you have these different link relationships of things you can do. And then from each of those, you have further link relationships, other things you can do. And it's again, it's all documented and pushed by the server, self-documented, so that if a new feature comes up, you get a new link relationship. And it doesn't break any existing things like SOAP or you know these WSDL situations where you change something or add a new feature, and everything's like, well, I didn't code to that. Now it's all broken. So at some point, we may use an out-of-the-box documentation system. So that right now, that's just built with Twig and Silex, and it's just kind of a homegrown deal. But it took a long time, so I'm proud of it. <laughs> I will definitely have to check that out. We actually are using um, Apiary. Yeah, APR is awesome. Actually, my my old boss from two jobs ago, Mark Foster, works at APR, and they're phenomenal. It was actually uh, last rest fest, or no, I think it was two rest fests ago. I gave my little because you have to give a talk if you get a rest fest. Everybody who goes gets a talk, so you give a five slides, five minutes deal. And I kind of gave that little spiel, and I gave these like, this is why it's wrong. This is why we have really bad hypermedia APIs because we're coding, we're telling programmers to code. Correct, incorrectly. We're, we're teaching them through our documentation systems to code to URLs when they should be coding to link relationships. And there was like a hurrah from the crowd, and it was one of the apiary guys. And they were like, yes. And he showed me, a, it was really cool, he showed me a, a GitHub uh, issue that had been open for months within their own technology on that topic. So I started posting, and then Kevin Swiber posted, and Mike Kelly posted, and Mike Amundsen posted. Like everybody that's building these specifications and writing books and, and documentation about this stuff, and they're pointing to the hypermedia API saying, hey, these guys are doing it. Like, we need to fix this. And it was just so cool. It was such a great validation because here I am kind of learning this. And then people are now saying, hey, this is the way we should be doing it. You know, and it was just cool that my, my little five and five talk, um, I feel had a little bit of an influence. And hopefully we'll, we'll continue to have an influence where people realize, hey, if we want to have really loosely coupled clients and servers, we should be coding to link relationships. That's what's made the internet so successful for decades is that these things are so decoupled. And we're actually following the REST constraints for certain, you know, for certain situations. Not every situation needs a REST API, but for those that do, it, it's a great way to go. Absolutely. Um, I'm actually looking at. I need to learn more about hypermedia APIs because we're doing an API at work. Um, and after talking with you last time, we attempted no capes. Um, hypermedia sounds amazing, and I'm I'm really interested in it. And I'm actually going to REST Fest this year. Sweet. Awesome. Yes, I am super excited. Uh, I've been talking with probably someone. Ben. Probably Ben. Either Ben or Mike. Mike. There yeah, Mike. Go. Okay, cool. <laughs> like I know his email address. Yeah, Mike Amundsen. He's awesome. He's amazing. He's come here in Nashville and, and given a talk before on on uh, APIs. He's he's incredible. Super smart dude. Nice. I really can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. And actually, you just reminded me that I need to go buy my ticket. I, know, I actually need to also. Like, we're already planning the trip. That'll be another one of those where we bring the family. That's another one I forgot to mention that we we drive to South Carolina and bring the, all the kids and everything. So we'll be there with the family. But it's it's kind of become a family event too because you see a lot of the same people there. And uh, Mark Foster will be there too. I mentioned him. He's been there the last couple. Well, I don't know if he's going this year, but he's been the last couple of years. And uh, it's just uh, it's just a great conference, really great conference. It's a nerve wracking one though too because it's like again everybody talks even if you know nothing about hypermedia. You're like, I've never done any hypermedia at all. They're like, sweet, give a talk about how you know nothing about hypermedia. Like, yeah. give a talk about what you don't understand. And and like, so every talk is interesting in its own different way. And um, yeah, I've heard some some really, really cool talks there. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely an interesting format. Um, it's, it's everyone talks for five minutes, right? Yeah. And then they have like more official talks too that are the normal kind of half hour. I mean, and some of those are amazing. Last year they did one on state machines that just blew my mind. I had one before that, they did one on Sparkle which is like the whole uh, semantic web stuff and how you could, he showed he showed stuff that just 
we could like, oh, here's a text file from over here. We wrap it in in REST HTML, you know, and then here's this thing over here, which is some like Java thing from you know ten years ago. We wrap that in a URL, and here's and then they start like using you know this query language, and eventually you build this amazing representation of reality that just everyone's just blown away. We couldn't believe how incredible it is. And it sounds like it's all voodoo magic, mysterious, like no one's actually doing this. But then you start listing off governments and gigantic multinational corporations that are actually using this stuff. And we're like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. Like we don't hear about it much in kind of our little, you know, little side project land. But there are big companies that are using REST in powerful ways. Pretty cool. That's awesome. I can't wait. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, and yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm bringing my kids to the conference, but I am road tripping down yonder with cool. them for the conference so and greensville is just awesome it's a cool town really really cool town i've never been there before i'm actually speaking there i think it's in greenville um at a, at a user group cool soon um in july and then i'll be in down for in september for um rest fest i'm very excited and everyone else should come if you're listening to this you should go buy a ticket to rest fest and then you can meet me and luke It'll yeah, you should probably have to be by ours because it fills up quickly. <laughs> yeah. It's a small conference. It's really about 50 or so people, so it does fill up pretty quickly. And speaking of which, I'm going to go set myself a reminder to go and get some tickets. It's going to be September 17th through 19th in Greenville, um, South Carolina, and it looks like an absolutely amazing, um, amazing conference. Looks like the opening keynote is by James Snell on practical semantics. Nice. I can remember meeting like you know uh, Leonard Richardson, like who did the Richardson maturity model of REST, and just being so blown away to meet these guys. I met Kevin Swiber one year, who did you know Siren VND Siren you know format, and then uh, Ben Longden, who I've met at other PHP conferences. He was there. He's an Air uh, VND Air, and just like guys that have written these books, and and oh, it's just you, you first get there, it's just kind of overwhelming, and then after, like I said, I've gone the last few years. You kind of just get friends with these guys that you otherwise would be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> and they realize they're just really, really cool, smart people. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of meeting your heroes, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, it really is. But they don't have capes, so. <laughs> right. I actually met um, John Resig. Is that his name? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I shook his hand once. I was very yes. proud. <laughs> I have a picture of me on Instagram with him. I was the biggest nerdy nerd girl ever. I was like, I need a picture with you, please. I totally walked up and said, I built my whole business on jQuery. Like, I love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> like our Justin Bieber. Yeah, really. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> yeah, that was that was a good day. Um, but no, it's definitely cool. To meet, to meet your heroes and, and to meet thought leaders in our industry and, and hear what they have to say and learn from them. It's absolutely fantastic. It totally is. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So um, let's see. We have about 12 minutes left. How was, um, so you said that you spoke first at um, PHP Tech before you realized that PHP Tech was kind of a big deal. Um, how were your nerves then, your first time speaking? I, I was, I was definitely nervous. Um, I'd done, I'd done like a couple, like you know, stuff at work. You know, you you have to give a presentation or stuff like that. So I'd done some similar things, and it was a, a, a few number of people there at the last job I had. Hmm. You're cutting up for me. I don't know if it's my connection or yours, but I'm not getting any audio. Boop, 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 boop. Tether off my phone. Yeah, you died for a second. Am I back? You're back. I am back. Yes, I did indeed die. Comcast, thank you much. Uh, Way to go, Comcast. I actually got a time to live exceeded response from one of my pings. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you had asked how how was it? Uh, how were the nerves? It was definitely definitely shaky. Uh, being in the big room, uh, it was definitely nerve wracking. But I think it went well. I kind of rushed through it a little bit. But I've always tried to like make eye contact with people 
and just kind of notice that it's not just this mass crowd of people, it's like individuals. And just if I can make eye contact with someone, smile, see them smile back, and then go, okay, that's a real person who's not mad at me. Okay, next, are you mad at me? No, okay, you're, you're actually paying attention. Awesome, you know? And, and you know, most people on their computers or, you know, with their phones or whatever. But I think if I can just connect with just enough people to feel happy about it, um, that makes a big difference for me. And then also to just realizing like, no matter how bad I may feel it is or how much of a critic I am with myself, usually, you know, so far I've gotten great reviews from people that say, hey, this is really helpful for me and all that. I remember that one, my first time I talked, I got one review that was really bad. And I remember like, I knew who it was. Like I, I and, and so I actually, I don't know if this is okay or not, but I followed up with them and said, oh, hey, I didn't quite understand your review, like what, what didn't make sense. And so we had this like conversation afterwards. And then later he was like, oh, I totally get it now. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, so it's kind of funny. Yeah, no, I, I think that A, I mean, A, connecting with people in the audience is the biggest thing. It's nice to be able to see people looking at you when you're giving a talk, hmm. um, which is probably one of the best, some of the best advice I can give to conference attendees is maybe once or twice during the talk, look over the top of your laptop. It helps speakers yeah, immensely yeah. when you do that. Um, That's a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, please. Just, you know, just glance up over the screen. Yeah, it helps us. Um, and also, lost my train of thought. Um, to be able, you know, to, someone who didn't understand something and now does because you got up on stage mm. and talked. I think that's that's immensely helpful. Um, what do you, you you mentioned that planning a talk it takes a lot of time and effort on your part. So what goes yeah. into that for you? Do you have a process or? Yeah, that's a really good question because I, I, I actually think that's probably the primary reason I don't submit to more talks. That's the primary reason I I feel more nervous leading up to the talk, like the weeks leading up to the talk, than I do at the actual talk. And a big reason of that is I, I just, I don't, I don't enjoy putting together slide decks. I don't enjoy like planning out the talk. And, and whenever I spend like an hour or two on it, I always feel like, oh man, that's an hour or two I should have been spending on my business. Or that's an hour or two I should have been fixing a bug or adding a feature or responding to help desk tickets in the, you know, or going to the forum. Like I feel like I'm wasting time, which is a terrible way to think about it because it's the most important thing. And I know that practicing it and refining it is so important. So almost every talk that I've given, I always feel like I always use like the basic standard ugly looking, you know, <laughs> slides that, you know, you can get on Google slides. And I guess I always feel like I, 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 I let the audience down that I didn't put more effort into prepping the slides and having a great slide deck. And, and so that's always the nerve wracking thing for me is kind of, did I put in enough effort and time to make the slides great and to really like refine it? And I will, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll practice it quite a bit. But I then, again, I always feel like I didn't practice enough. I don't record myself, which is a lot of a really great thing a lot of people do. I, I would recommend definitely doing it. Uh, I always feel like I should have put in more time. I always feel like I'm kind of doing that last minute winging it thing. And because I've gotten pretty good reviews when I've given talks, I've kind of let myself get away with that. Um, and I think it kind of hit home a little bit um, at Lone Star when I got to do the, the keynote. I added more content to the talk, but I rushed through it. And so the end, I like totally stalled out. And I got nervous when my wife came in with our kids. I think I, I like to blame her. But, but I was like talking about all these kind of different, you know, helpful tools. And it just it didn't flow. Like it, the first part was great and inspiring. And the second part wasn't so good. It was much better at PHP World. And it just reminded me like, man, if I'm gonna do this, I gotta put in the time to do it right. I really need to prep, I really need to have great slides. So that's always the most stressful part for me is just saying, is this time worth spending? And do I value the audience enough to really put in the time of this and just tell myself no to all the other voices trying to say, hey, you should be doing this, there's this bug fix, you gotta roll out this tag, you gotta get this code going. And it's, it's, it's hard for me to actually focus on prepping the talk and making sure it's right. So some of the best slides that I've ever seen were actually the simplest. Really? Oh, uh, yeah. Have you ever seen um, Igor Wadler give a talk? Yes. I'm trying to think where. He gives a great talk on state machines. He's given one. I've seen him do a talk on touring completeness. I've seen him do a talk. Was he at, was he at Rest Fest last year? I wonder if that was the state machine one he did. I don't know. I can find out. Sure. Yeah, I mean... Yes, great slides, like simple slides are so, I mean, it, the most impressive ones are the ones where they like basically don't even need slides, but you're, you're totally learning a ton. Those are ones where I'm like, oh man, guys yes. are amazing, or girls amazing, whoever, like it's just, that's super impressive when they can carry the audience and deliver great content, but they're not like reading slides. I mean, that's the worst, you know? 
I think if I had my preference, I probably wouldn't use slides. I hate making slide decks too. Um, yeah. I would rather just get up there and like talk for yeah. 45 minutes, but that's probably wouldn't be the best for the audience. But yeah, the best talks that I've ever seen have the simplest slides that are the most minimal. Mm. Um, and I think it's probably, I mean, it's definitely an art to be able to refine it down to only what is absolutely necessary. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a challenge for me. Like how minimal can I make this slide deck and get my talk across, mm. my point across? Um, so that's, that's my biggest challenge. Yeah, it's like I, I could have written less, but it would have taken longer, right? <laughs> it's just, yeah, not easy. Yeah, so you said you don't record yourself. Do you go through, like, dry runs of the talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll do dry runs, and then, like, if I'm driving around or just, you know, getting ready in the morning, whatever, I'll be trying to think through the sequence of events, you know, that you talk about this, and you talk about that, talk about that. Um, try to kind of think through whatever I put in the notes of the slide. Like, oftentimes, I'll have notes that are speaker notes there, but I try not to use them. I try not to read while I'm giving a talk as much as possible. Um, I've given a, the, the, the rest talk, I don't know, four or five times. And I usually have sections in there that's like real technical language about the constraints of rest. Like what, and that I'll often just read, you know, what is, a, what is Hadios hypermedia as an engine of application state? And you know, what, what, are, what are the actual constraints? And just, I wanna make sure that I'm, there's, there's no way to be clearer than you know Roy Fielding's description from his own you know <laughs> paper. So I, sometimes I'll read some of that stuff, and that's the kind of stuff I want to make sure I'm real familiar with. So even if I am reading it, it it flows nicely. Um, but yeah, I, I try to run through it at least a few times. I mean, more the better. Yeah, I I can't record myself either. I have yet to watch any recording of myself mm. like ever. I can't do it. Um, but I do I do you know walk through them. Many, many times. I do a lot of run-throughs in the shower. <laughs> yeah, I was um, going to say the shower, and I was like, I don't know if that's appropriate, but I do. I actually practice in the shower quite a bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's definitely appropriate. <laughs> all of my best ideas come in the shower. Oh, heck yeah. So <laughs> it's so relaxed, you know. To go which, through. What's funny is um, the first, I think the first one I've seen of myself recorded was PHP World. They did, Eli did a really great recording of those talks, and when that came out on YouTube, I actually watched it and and I shared it with our team and it was really cool. Like our team was like, "Man, Luke, you did a really great job." And I was like, "Oh wow!" It's like, "Oh, I feel so good now." Like it was neat because my team couldn't go, so it was just neat to share that experience a little bit with them, you know. And and the, all the um, I should mention all the Rest Fest talks are recorded, so you, all those are on Vimeo. If you go to Vimeo and search for Rest Fest, so I did see myself in those little five and five, but it's like. Usually not the greatest audio quality, you know, because it's like in a little handheld thing from the other side of the room. But uh, but some great content, really great content. So those those talks are all there. Usually they get a sponsor that, that enables that. But yeah, it is a little weird. You know, you start counting your ums and your uhs, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, all of that. I have, I have a good friend who's um, a speech coach, and she's fantastic. And I've had her watch a couple of my talks to tell me what not to do ever right. again. Nice. Um, like my very first talk, I couldn't, I got through 15 seconds of the video and I turned it off, but apparently I was wearing a hoodie and the entire time that I was on stage, I was doing this with my hoodie strings because <laughs> I was nervous. <laughs> and so within nice. seconds of her watching this video, she messaged me and said, don't ever touch your hoodie strings again. Nice. Yes. And that is a weird thing. What do you do with your hands? That is a weird thing. Like, yeah. especially when you have a, a stage where you can like, you're expected to kind of like, you know, I walk across the stage a little bit, but yeah, I always... I talk a lot with my hands and I'm kind of like, yeah, ah, ah, but then sometimes it just kind of feels weird. And you're like, well, I'm not going to you know, fold my arms or I, it's a little bit, it can be awkward. I don't even know what I do. I probably hook my yeah. thumbs into my belt buckle or like my belt loops because I do. I've done that too. In my pockets. It's, yeah. it's, just, it's probably very awkward. I don't want to see the video. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll get better someday. But I've seen, so do, you I've seen should, do you think I should submit to uh, conferences in Europe? Yes, slide, do it. Get some good slide decks together. And, yeah. I've spoken in Europe twice. I spoke at Laracon EU, and I spoke at J and Beyond um, very recently. Actually, I was in Prague in yes, the end yes, of May. Yes, Yeah, seeing that on social media. Very cool. Yes, definitely do it. It's the most amazing experience ever. Nice. Um, it's, it's just so different. It's so different from the U.S. Mm. in ways that I never would have imagined. Hmm. Um, and there's so much history to it, and like sightseeing, especially if you can swing making it a family thing. Yeah, that's that's what we've talked about. That was that would be the excuse to throw everybody on a plane and get out there. Yeah, that would be oh, really absolutely. Helpful. Yes, I would. I would absolutely. Um, there, 
I'm trying to think of conferences that are coming up in Europe. I know they're doing like a DDD conference in Utrecht, hmm. which is kind of cool. Um, and then, of course, there's always PHP Benelux. Hmm. Um, and I forget, they announced where J and Beyond is going to be next year, but I forget. God. Oh, see, I'm starting to get sweaty hands already just thinking about it. You know what I mean? It's always like, oh, then I have to put a slide deck together. Oh, I'd have to have a good talk. What if I get rejected? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, my thing, I, I mean, I find European conferences to be a little bit more stressful. Um, and I would assume that probably Europeans, you know, essentially mm -hmm. you're flying across a, an ocean. Um, and sometimes the conference organizers are covering your travel. So you are being paid or, you know, your travel is being paid for you to fly across an entire ocean to an entire another country to give a talk. Like, it's just that much more, yeah. please don't let me suck. Please don't yeah. suck. I, yes. The upside is that you have, like, a 12-hour plane ride to practice said talk. Yeah, over, yeah. Over, over again for 12 <laughs> hours. Anyone who can sleep on transatlantic flights is much better than I because I cannot. I hope to have the opportunity at some point. <laughs> you definitely should. And when you do, you should tell me about it. Because maybe I'll right. also fly across the ocean and go watch it. <laughs> okay, so I think we're about out of time. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't get to? No, I, I, it's been fun. Uh, thanks for again for letting me talk about the story of Foxcart a little bit. And, and Hypermedia APIs is kind of my passion. And also, uh, got a little plug in there for Bitcoin, too. If you haven't checked out Bitcoin, check it out. It's good stuff. I actually got to do a panel discussion at ZenCon about Bitcoin, which is really cool. That was kind of an alternate thing that they did at ZenCon. So I, I got to be up on a big stage, uh, and that was that was really cool. So, yeah, those are kind of my passions, that and family. So I got to talk about all that stuff. So thanks. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been a blast. I really enjoyed talking to you, um, and I'm glad our Internet connections were much more well-behaved this time. So <laughs> uh, if you want to talk about Hypermedia APIs or um, Bitcoin, apparently, find Luke on the Twitter. and. Yeah. Um, talk to them about that, or come to RestFest and see us both in um, South Carolina this September. Thanks, everybody.